Hi, I'm Gabriel Napora. I'm a film producer and financier. I've won the Toronto International Film Festival, the Sundance Film Festival. I've had the number one documentary in the world. Uh, I've worked with talent such as Leonardo DiCaprio, Vin Diesel, and The Rock. And on today's show, we're going to talk about how movies impact and influence leaders and leadership. We're going to talk about how we have a responsibility to stop rewarding mediocrity. And we're also going to talk about how leaders have a responsibility to tell stories that are deeply emotional and human. I'm very excited to talk to you all. Stay tuned. Congratulations. You are tuned into Dolph Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives and those who are dedicated to creating a quantum leap in leadership. Your host, Dolph Barron, he's an executive mentor to leaders like you, a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, CEO World, and he's been featured on CNN, Fox, CBS, and many other notable sites. Dolph Barron is an international business speaker who was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers to hire. Now, over to Dolph Barron. Welcome, dear friends, fans, and fellow aficionados of Leadership Excellence. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Leadership and Loyalty Tips for Executives. Every leader today knows that the stories we tell impact the brand, they impact the culture, and the organization. What we may not have considered is how these stories determine who our people show up as. Let me give you an example. Uh, back in 1974, yes, I am that old, uh, back in 1974, I saw Bruce Lee in a movie called Enter the Dragon. And as a result, I and millions of other young fellas started martial arts. We started studying martial arts. Who among us hasn't seen a high-speed chase movie and then left the cinema and drove home uh, maybe not quite the way you drove to the cinema? The stories that we tell ourselves and the stories that we're told impact and influence us. As leaders, what stories are you allowing to impact you and those that you lead? Well, stay tuned because that's where we're going on the next two episodes as we sit down with an award-winning movie producer. Now, as always, we need your help in staying relevant, so please, do us a favor, please, <laughs> go over to wherever it is that you tune into the show from, and do us a favor, rate, review, and subscribe to the show. If you are a regular listener to the show, big thank you to you. We really appreciate it. Thank you for making us the number one podcast globally for Fortune 500 listeners. And we are also honored and grateful to be cited by Inc.com as the number one podcast to make you a better leader. In case you are curious, and I know you are, I'm Dov Barron, I'm your host, and I'm here to assist you tapping into the one thing in your business that changes everything by transforming meaning into action. Curious to know more? Simply go to DovBarron.com. That's D-O-V-B-A-R-O-N.com. All right, let's strip it down and dive right in. What determines who we are, is it nature or nurture, is a long, long debate. But actually, that debate is over. The human, the human Genome Project showed us that the primacy of DNA, nature, is what gives us the predominance towards physical, even mental and emotional conditions. But it is epigenetics, nurture, the environment, that determines whether those genes are turned on or off. Now, you may be wondering, what is epigenetics? Well, consider it this way. Here's a very simple way of understanding it. Uh, if, if you or I spend time in the sun, we develop a tan. That is essentially an epigenetic process. It involves the changing of genes expression that increases the production of melanin in the skin, resulting in you having a tan, or I having a tan. Similarly, for example, if someone lives in a family environment that is high stress or even traumatic, that can trigger certain genetic responses ranging from immunity issues to health, uh, other kinds, or even mental illness. But to get a little more granular, we must be willing to also consider the environmental situations we find ourselves in both in childhood and in our adult life because they're all having impact. For example, are you putting yourself or, or the, the people around you in an environment that reinforces painful or traumatic situations? Let's consider the stories that we tell ourselves about who we are and what we can become. 
There are stories in the environment that you grow up in. There are stories that you take in that tell you about who you are. What are the stories that you were given? Every day, the news cycle, just think about this for a minute. Every day, the news cycle leads with the most violent and shocking news. And we are regularly showing up for that. We find ourselves glued to bad news. Yes, the media has its part, but so do we. We get to choose to turn it on or choose it off, or turn it off. Then there are the modern storytellers. Those who make the TV shows we watch and the movies we watch. What is their responsibility in making socially relevant movies, socially, socially relevant entertainment? Well, that's just a taste of where we're going in the next couple of episodes because our guest today is Gabriel Napura. He is an international award-winning film producer and financer. His films have won the biggest film festivals in the world, including the Toronto International Film Festival and Sundance Film Festival. He has the most critically he had the most critically acclaimed film of 2020 and the top documentary in the world in April of 2021. He's currently producing a slate of films with some of Hollywood's top stars, including um, people like, would you believe, would you can believe it, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. His films, um, like, the, like I said, some of them have won great awards. Uh, I'll give you an example, a film I watched that just loved, a movie called Skin, which won the prestigious uh, Toronto International Film Award. Superb film, really helping you to understand uh, the far right and the impact of that in a story format. There's a g fantastic movie um, called the Ki uh, Kindergarten Teacher. No, it's not about Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's a superb film. It won the um, Top Directors Award at the Sundance Film Festival, and that's out of 15,000 submissions. And then there's Bisping, which was the world's top documentary for two weeks in 2022, which is about uh, uh, someone you're probably familiar with if you follow um, uh, cage fighting. I mean, it's just superb. This is just among others. As I said, he's done movies with Leonardo DiCaprio, The Rock, Jordan Peterson. Uh, he is committed to working on socially relevant films and documentaries that make people think. So, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and help me to welcome award-winning movie producer and financer, Gabriel DeBoer! Thanks for having me, guys. <laughs> so happy to be here. You're welcome, mate. Very welcome. It's good to have you on the show. I really appreciate it. You and I have been chatting backwards and forwards for a few years, and we have some friends in common, and, and that's really good. And I wanted to have you on the show because movies slash entertainment are a big part of all of our lives. So in the context of leadership development, because, you know, we're, we're speaking to leaders in, in any and all forms, what do you feel is the relevance of of storytelling in the context of movies and TV? What's what's the relevance in the development of leadership in the world today? Um, you know, are, is our movies doing a bad job of that? Are doing a good job of it? What where do they need to pick up their game? What's missing? Fill us in. I think it's a great question. From the inside of the industry, you see a, a lot of leadership development in that the industry has cleaned itself out, like with the Me Too mm -hmm. movement and uh, a lot of bad people have, have gotten out of it, which I think permeates in a lot of different industries. So I think we were one of the leaders in terms of getting rid of a lot of sexual harassment stuff, stuff that happened in that way. Mr. Um, Weinstein, for example. A great example. Um, technologically, we're leaders in terms of using artificial intelligence. Uh, we're leaders in terms of using a lot of different technology to get done what we what we do. In terms of the actual movies themselves, and I think the content of movies and developing leaders, I do feel we could do a better job. I think a lot of films at this point don't come away with a very deep message and don't always come away with something where you know, it causes people to think. And I think, you know, one of the ways that, that we try and do things is we do try and do movies that inspire people and, and make them think, allowing them to potentially, you know, be leaders of tomorrow. Because I think the more that you think and the more that you see stuff and the more that you see, um, you know, mentorship in movies and stuff like that through the stories we tell, 
I think that's how you can inspire a lot of people to, uh, to do great things in the future. And I think we have to do better as a, as a, um, industry. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate it. You know, I just, um, the, the, there are two sides to life, generally speaking, um, uh, certainly for those of us who live in the first world. And there is, it's not true, but we make it true in that there's the, there's the life we have, the internal life we have, and the external life we have is the other part. And the external life we have is often driven by money. We understand that. Hollywood is a, is a, is a machine, uh, a money machine. And... You know, I, I don't know if you've been watching, but I've been watching a superb series called The Offer. Have you heard of that show? I have heard of it. I haven't started watching it yet, though. I'm excited about it. Fantastically, yeah. brilliantly done show about the making of the movie The Godfather. Yeah. A and what it took, which is a Herculean task. I mean, it was, and everybody in the movie does, a, in the show, the series does a superb job. But the key in it is this inter, I mean, there's the obvious story of the difficulties of making the show, but the subtext is it has to make money. And if it's not making money and we're betting on this, whatever this is, making money and, you know, there's the artists fighting on one side for to tell a fantastic story, which clearly they did with The Godfather, and for the best people to tell that story with the actors. But on the other side of it is the industry that's saying, we, you know, this is show, quote, business. So where is that balance, Gabriel? Where, you know, where is that? Because I know you know this. There are documentary makers. You make documentary movies as, much, as well as other movies. There are documentaries that are brilliant, superb, and the, those documentary makers, you know, are living on the bones of their ass. I mean, they're, you know, they're scraping through. Where's the balance? Well, I think it's a, it's a great question. And I think regardless of whether you're doing something that's very artistically based or you're doing something that's um, very, let's say, business based, I think both can meld together very well. Um, Artistic films, there's certain things you can do to enhance your chances of making money. And that would include having star power in that project. Um, that would include who you have distribution with. Like there's all sorts of different factors that, that play into that. And on the other side, on the business side, even if you're doing, let's say an action film, which a lot of us love action films or martial arts films, you were talking about martial arts earlier, that doesn't mean that those films have to be devoid of deep themes and great ideas and make people think. So both can meld together. You can make money on artistic films and, and, and you can have deep themes in business films. And I think that they can meet in the middle. It's just, you have to have both sides of your brain working to find that right mix. Well, the reason I'm asking that is because, you know, um, you didn't start off in movies, you started out in business. And this is part of why you're on the show. You started out in business, you were, you know, you were a business major before you were ever in part of the movies. So talk to us about that transition. <laughs> like, you know, you're going into the business world, this is what you're going to be out. And now you're, you know, you're, you're rubbing elbows with Hollywood elite. Talk to us about that transition. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's a really interesting transition because a lot of people in my industry, it was always their dream to be in the industry. And I can't say that about myself. Mm -hmm. My dream was to own a business, you know, and just mm -hmm. grow the business and try and be successful. And, and, you know, through a series of, you know, shocking events that I wouldn't have expected to kind of happen, uh, I got brought into the industry. And, and when you're in the industry, the beautiful thing about this industry is not only do you get to use your business mind, but you really get to use your creative mind and work with, you know, some people who are really brilliant in both areas of business and creativity. And I, I think that elevates everyone. So, you know, from my end, the transition, it, it's really running a business, but it's running a business under certain parameters and understanding, you know, certain rules, just like anybody would, you know, who you talk to, there's always different rules for different industries. I, I think the great thing about my industry is you can break a lot of rules and still be very successful as long as you have certain fundamentals as it relates to things. But talk to us about your story. Your my transition. story? Yeah, okay, your so, so my, my, my actual how I got into film and that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, because you were uh, in business. 
I was in business. So, so my story is I, I went to a uh, business school and I took several years of business. And then, you know, at the end um, of my course for a summer, I went to go work sales and I worked for this alarm company that was selling very, very high end alarms. Like I was, I don't know, 20 years old, 19 years old and trying to sell, you know, $5,000 security alarms. So that whole summer, I must have done, I would say, 40 to 50 meetings and I didn't sell a single alarm and it was all commission based. So I completely, completely failed and, and wasn't sure what I was going to do with my life. Not that my goal was necessarily sales, but I, I just felt very lost. So I went back to the school where I'd taken these business courses and I noticed on the wall of the uh, bulletin board there, there was an opportunity to audition for uh, an acting role in the film department. And I thought on a whim, well, I'm not an actor. I've never taken any training, but you know, why not? Mm -hmm. So I auditioned, I oddly got the role, not that I'm a talented actor. And in doing the production with this group, I noticed I wasn't a fan of acting. It wasn't my thing, but I really, really enjoyed what they were doing behind the scenes. I thought it was amazing. Mm. So I decided to enroll in uh, film after that, uh, did a couple of years. At the end of that course, you had to do a four month unpaid practicum. Uh, I did it with a, a large film production company and absolutely worked my butt off. And at the end of uh, that- Was that in Vancouver? Uh, that was actually in Edmonton. In Edmonton? Yeah. It was a big film. Oh, so, okay. And at the end of that, they made me a, a, a television commercial producer. So I was doing, you know, international commercials and uh, that sort of thing at quite a young age. And then did a couple of years of that and started my own business and just kind of grew it from there. So when, when you when you look at that, um, you know, that, that coming through those sort of stages what's interesting to me is that you you know you you were not selling anything like yeah. you know you went out and you did you couldn't do sales but now you're in you, you know you're not just a movie producer you're also a financer all right so you've got to raise capital yes that's selling so tell tell to me about that because you know here's the guy who's doing 40 or 50 meetings trying to sell a five grand um alarm system it was yeah. now probably selling 50 million <laughs> you know it's yeah. it's a little bit of a jump there gabriel it, it, it is, you know <laughs> it is it is a very big jump and I, I was very lucky to have some pretty amazing mentors who taught me about the sales process but i, I think the biggest thing um and the real blessing to be in this industry is if you really believe in something and and with my very core i believe in the films that we're doing and we've done if you believe in something that deeply, it, it translates to people. It translates in how you talk to them. When I'm a you know, 19 year old kid selling $5,000 alarms, being completely honest, I don't think I believed in it. You know, like that's an expensive alarm system. Does it really work? I probably didn't understand crime and you know, all the issues of why you would even want a security alarm. But when it comes to film and you're, you're giving these deep meanings and, and messages that you truly believe in to your very core, it becomes a lot easier to sell something and to bring in capital and to, to be a part of something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're right. Now you've been doing, um, you know, you've done, like I said, you've done documentaries, you've done uh, lots of films, you've done all those. Talk to us about, you know, your perspective on the relevance of storytelling because of movies and, and TV, et cetera. What is the relevance of it that you see? And, and do you think that it's changed? And when I talk about that, I'm talking about in the context of, you know, we see a movie and then we suddenly realize, oh, this movie is a commentary on, even though it never says the name, right? So it might be a commentary on George W. Bush. It might be a commentary. I mean, you know, you see movies like Vice, which are obviously about that era, but you see other movies that are not about that at all. That, you know, they're not about anybody in the political, but you can see it's a, it's a political commentary or it's a commentary about uh, transient people or it's a commentary about uh, people who are refugees and, and their, their stories. Talk to us about what you see as uh, movies and TVs, the relevance, uh, the importance of relevant stories and, 
are we doing a good enough job on that? And, and how do we educate the public to be able to see things? Because I know you and I have had discussions where I, I see a film and I know that nobody else saw that movie. Right. And by that, I don't mean I was the only person ever went to saw the movie. I mean, what I'm, the way I'm seeing it is so vastly different than other people or most other people. So what's your thoughts on that, on this, the relevance of storytelling today in what is pretty much a hyperbolic um, media environment that is definitely, you know, pushing towards the polarization? I, th I think if you look at storytelling as a whole, it's really how we communicate with each other. Mm, storytelling is really a way that we bring each other together in a way that we, you know, both visually, auditory, and almost with all senses come together and, and form an understanding. So it's really, to me, it's very essential to the human experience. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's really key to everything. In terms of storytelling today, I think our industry sometimes gets it very right. And I think where we get it right is when we don't hit people over the head. I think it's a, it's a scenario where audiences are very, very smart. People are very smart. And if we want to convey a message, you have to do it in such a way that it allows people to think versus us doing it in a way that's too forceful. And people just immediately turn away from that. Uh, there's examples, in my opinion, of both where you can do something very successful and get people to think in an intelligent way. And there's other ways where I think the filmmaker feels that the audience might be a little bit dumb and uh, hits them over the head and that just immediately turns people off. So I, I think the key to it is just moderation of allowing people, giving a message, but, but giving enough space that people can think for themselves. And I think storytelling honestly is, is the way that we can change the world, you know, to, to the world that we all probably aspire to and really wanna see. So, so let, let's pick that up in, in the context of your own work. Um, let's talk about the movie Skin. Sure. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. So give everybody a little bit of background on that, that, and then we'll sort of jump into it, because I think it's going to be a way for people to understand what we're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Skin is really a project about a, I don't want to ruin it for anyone, but a, a true story about a skinhead back in the 80s and, and nine, well, more the 80s, I guess, 70s and 80s skinheads were, I guess you'd almost call them sort of neo-Nazis in a certain yep. sense, very, very yep. racist and um, violent in some ways as well. And, and the story is about how a skinhead comes to realize that all of his beliefs are wrong and the group that he's with is not a, a, a good group conducive to what he really wants to do with his life. Um, the, the person in question had tattoos all over his body and the story is about how he gets these tattoos removed and sort of transitions from a skinhead to somebody with deep compassion. Um, the project came to us, we had a read of the script, we thought it was, the director was amazing, we thought the film was, or the script was just incredible and it's, it, it had deep themes, so we had to get involved. So like I said, I've seen the film, um, I'm trying to remember the name of the actor now. What's his name? Uh, Jamie Bell. Jamie Bell, um, who is a phenomenal British actor, been Incredible. in lots of stuff, um, although this is not a British movie. Um, and um, so you, you saw it, it looks good, but why do you pick it, right? Because um, when did you do that movie? Uh, that movie was 2019, 2020. Right. So 2019, 2020, um, the far right, uh, massive in the U.S. by this point, there is a clear growth in that movement. Outside of it being um, a great story, well written, and a good producer, a uh, good director, what is what is the what's the pull of the message for you? that makes you go, we got to make this? I think with any film, it's about emotion for us. With any script we read, it's really about emotion. When we read it, is it something that we think is going to make the world a better place? Is it something that makes us like cry or laugh or, or get angry? Um, I think the success or failure of most filmmakers 
can be distilled down to a certain level of how much emotion does it make you feel? You know, and based on that emotion in reading that script and the other projects we've done, we just immediately felt emotion. And we, we felt too with our morals and our values and where we want the world to go. We, we thought, you know, an anti-racist message and a message that anybody can change, no matter how awful a person might be or how, you know, um, set they are in their ways, you can still change. And, and that's what really appealed to us is the emotional impact of it. Yeah. Um, for, uh, for our listeners, they may be familiar, uh, if certainly the regular listeners are, um, we interviewed uh, Tony McAleer on here. Tony's an ex-client, of, well, he's an ex-client, now a friend of mine. Uh, Tony and I spoke at the United Nations and the Department of State on de-radicalizing the far right because Tony was a neo-Nazi. He was the head of war, white Aryan race, um, and took uh, the Canadian government, or the, the BC government, to the Supreme Court to try and have British Columbia become a white-only province um, back in the day. Um, since then, Tony um, started a, a group called Life After Hate. He is the founder of The Cure for Hate, and that's the name of his book, by the way. Um, and he now speaks around the world at Holocaust places. You know, he was a Holocaust denier, of course. And... Um, um, in synagogues and um, uh, he was just in Sweden speaking to the Swedish government. I mean, he travels the world to do this work. Um, um, and very kindly, he credits me with the de-radical- his de-radicalization, that I de-radicalized him. And that's why we were both at the UN. Uh, and so, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's possible for somebody to change. Um, but it's really interesting uh, that you bring that up, Gabriel, because a lot of my work around... Uh, emotional source code is in debunking this bullshit idea that to be a great leader, you have to um, uh, be stoic and you must push your emotions to the side and repress them. And that's just not true. Um, in fact, that, you know, that anybody who's ever watched a movie that they liked, it was because of the emotional impact. And it doesn't matter whether it was, uh, you know, uh, uh, a Chevy Chase ridiculous comedy from the 80s or 90s, or whether it was a thought-provoking show like Skin, you know, it, it's the emotional content that counts. And, and I think there's an interesting um, responsibility in that because it is emotional, but is it emotional f- like the news? It leads because it bleeds and it's going to get a big reaction versus am I tapping into something that is authentic and genuine within the viewer? And I really would like to know what that wrestle is like for you and for your team and for your company. As we come towards the end of part one of the show, um, I want to come back in part two and I want to talk about the future of movie making, the future of, because it's all changing. The future of movie making is going to change dramatically and has already changed. Um, So I want to talk more about that. Before we do, before we go to that though, I would love for you to tell our viewers, our listeners more about where they can find out more about you, about your company and about the the projects you're working on and what it is you do. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, our company website is electricpandaentertainment.com. Uh, you can also, you know, type out my name on Internet Movie Database, which is IMDb, if you want to see uh, what projects I produced or what projects I've been a part of. And uh, at times, you know, I've given speeches and all sorts of stuff like that. So you can find me probably on YouTube and just on the Internet uh, as well. OK, good. So, of course, we'll make sure that all those links are posted in the show notes. So you'll be able to reach out to Gabriel and find out more about his company, and about his projects there, too. We're going to be back in just one click, so stay curious, my friends. Stay curious. We'll be back for part two of our delicious conversation with movie producer and financer Gabriel Naporov.